Okay, so I think we'll get started. A very warm welcome to everyone to this uh, panel discussion on life sciences startups, the intersection of academia and industry. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to host this event on behalf of Purdue University. There's a team from Purdue University over here. So today we're going to have, uh, first off, a small presentation on life sciences research at Purdue University by Dr. Suresh Garimela, the Executive Vice President of Research and Partnerships at Purdue. And then we'll head off into the panel discussion. Uh, we, have, we have a very um, uh, uh, stellar cast for the panel discussion. Unfortunately, Professor Rao couldn't join us today. But we do have Dr. Gayatri Savarwal from IBAB, who will uh, be part of the panel. And uh, Dr. Garimala is going to moderate the panel discussion. So without much further ado, I request Dr. Garimala to please come and uh, start the proceeding. I'll give it to you make a buzz otherwise. Do I have to turn it on or is it on? Okay. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, great. I have the clicker. Yes, thank you. So, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Savita, thank you very much for, uh, for kicking this off. And uh, my, my sincere thanks to uh, Professor Mayer uh, for uh, agreeing to host us on very short notice after what I understand was a bacchanalian uh, uh, sort of experience over the last few uh, or last week or so with your 25th anniversary. Um, uh, President Daniels and I uh, and my colleagues have been visiting your uh, beautiful campus and it's uh, truly fascinating. There's so much here that, uh, that you've done right uh, that we can learn from and that uh, in some ways resonates with what is happening at Purdue. And I'm hoping that there'll be a lot of follow-up here and we can uh, pick up both on the basic science and that, that NCBS does, uh, this, this group culture that uh, INSTEM has, as well as the translation culture uh, or translational efforts at uh, CCAMP. Uh, so, so fascinating visit. What I wanted to do was um, just many of you may not have thought about Purdue or may not be quite aware of uh, why we are here, why NCBS. Uh, for us, and so I thought I'd give you a very quick introduction to a few, um, uh, say, priorities at Purdue right now that are resonant. Um, I will not do justice to any of these topics because we will not go deep into the science in a few slides, nor will I cover all the ex uh, examples of our, um, uh, you know, translation success and so on, but it'll give you a flavor. And if any of that is of interest, you can certainly uh, raise questions. Our hope is, I'll, I'll cover this in a few minutes, we'll get the panelists up, um, start off a, a few uh, questions, and then I'm hoping that those of you in the audience uh, understand there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurs here, successful and to be successful, and so if you're wel uh, you know, you'll be welcome to ask questions. So, um, well, that'll be our panel. I'll come back and introduce them in a bit, but mostly we're talking about life sciences and the intersection between academia and industry. Um, I, I'll start off by saying that one thing that's somewhat unique about Purdue is that about a third of our funding, uh, say last year, and over time about a quarter of our funding, our research awards, have come from the corporate and foundation uh, sources. That's quite unusual for any university in the U.S. as well and probably here as well. So we uh, believe in very deep partnerships with the private sector uh, and with foundations and find that that's a very enriching way. Uh, and I. I don't mean that as a pun, but uh, to do the research. So uh, that's why the academia and so on. So in particular for this panel, um, I thought I'd point out that, uh, so President Daniels has been at Purdue for a few years now, and one of his um, uh, sort of uh, guiding principles was that let's focus on a few areas, go deep, make an impact, uh, rather than sort of spreading uh, our resources and our efforts too broadly. And so in the life sciences broadly, we have four major uh, initiatives. You know, together, we've made about a $250 million investment uh, in, in this space, um, and, 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 and there's more to come. It's, it, it's relatively nascent. Plant Sciences, Purdue, uh, Purdue's Agriculture, Department, uh, Agriculture College, is amongst the top in the world. It's been ranked uh, for a long time that way. 
uh, and we have uh, uh, we have a range of interests all the way from basic biology, plant biology to phenotyping. So we have some very nice efforts in phenotyping. We just uh, inaugurated a plant phenotyping network that actually there were people from India uh, attending as well. About 116 countries were represented for the kickoff, etc. So it'll be a uh, sort of a uh, a hub uh, to host a lot of information that uh, might be of interest. Um, also, we have Indiana, we have lots of space, so we, we have uh, uh, farms that we do this phenotyping work on with drones, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and then, so there's the basic biology, there's the phenotyping, then there's the innovation, and, and then the translation as well. So there's a lot of entrepreneurship focus in the, uh, uh, in the plant science uh, initiative. Uh, Pur the Purdue Institute for Drug Discovery, uh, again, Purdue is somewhat unique. Uh, I don't quite know how we got here, but uh, as I'll, I'll show you about it, one slide for each of these things. Um, we have great strength in, in drug discovery in terms of the number of compounds b that, that are being looked at for, 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 uh, as drug candidates, um, 16 of them in human trials, etc. So I'll talk about that. And more recently, we've... Um, we did a, an open call. I don't quite know how you do this here. It sounds almost like uh, the person who comes into NCBS brings with him or her an area, but, but we have maybe about 600 faculty broadly in the life sciences. So we had an open competition and invited faculty to propose areas for investment, and the two that came out of the 17 that, of ideas uh, that won out uh, with a quite rigorous process, uh, peer-reviewed process, is... Uh, an institute in the integrative neuroscience area, and one in inflammation, immunology, and infectious disease. So I would say, yes, we do many things that are not listed here, but these four are our major focus areas. And, um, and throughout all of this, I think I'll just kind of underline it by saying that Purdue has been historically very well known for engineering and agriculture. So where we can draw in the engineering and ag, for example, Integrative neuroscience is, has a very strong emphasis in imaging writ large, imaging in, 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 in of, of many k kinds. Um, and then similarly, the drug discovery elements are tied into infectious disease. So these are not uh, you know, silos. They're, they're sort of four strengths. And uh, particularly these three have been coming together more and more as sort of a cluster, if you will, that, that like you are trying to do. So um, again, you know, it's hard to pick two examples, but... One of our professors, Torbert, has uh, been uh, looking at enhancing the carotenoid uh, content of corn for, for health purposes and such, and, and that's coming close to uh, commercialization. Again, I'll run through this rather quickly. Phil Owens has done some amazing work in, um, in, in sort of soils mapping, uh, where the uh, hydrology, the carbon content, uh, and essentially the potential for growing specific crops uh, as well as the water content is mapped, and that's been commercialized into a, uh, into a company as well. So, in fact, he applied, I think what he's showing you there uh, applies to uh, a region in Colombia, in the country of Colombia called the Orinoquia region. Um, so that's just one example of some uh, commercialization out of the ag uh, area. Drug development, again, our focus is on those four areas, if you will, again, broadly. Uh, you probably can't read each of these things, and even if you did, uh, you know, we don't have time to discuss each one. But what we've plotted here is essentially the, uh, uh, you know, the phases in which these molecules are. We have about 44, 45 uh, uh, <coughs> compounds that, that, were, that are being studied in various, uh, uh, you know, in, in various uh, regions of the spectrum. One of the most recent ones is in malaria, where there's some extremely exciting uh, uh, human trials that are happening in Vietnam and we think that, that could be quite uh, game-changing. Um, and that drug discovery, uh, actually one part of the investment that uh, we made in, in, in this area was a building uh, dedicated to drug discovery. There's, a, for example, a high-throughput, high-content screening facility going up. That'll be ready in, a, in just a couple of months. Um, and, and so that's one piece. Um, and just to give you a sense, we have uh, clinical trials going on, of course, all over the U.S. on the right, uh, every state but two, well, but three, are, uh, ha ha are hosting some of our uh, drug trials. Um, as, uh, as also in the, in, the, in the world, you'll see 4,600 places, 4,300 places uh, where clinical trials are going on. So really, this is uh, drug discovery, I would say, is a very great strength of Purdue. We've got chemistry faculty, biochemistry, molecular, uh, sorry, uh, medicinal chemistry and molecular pharmacology for, uh, and so on. So 
there are multiple domains that have uh, contributed to this. Um, on the neuroscience side, again, maybe if I had to show one slide, I'd just show this to, uh, to, to, to give you a sense for the emphasis areas of development, genetics, and neuropharmacology. As, so there's about four thrusts here, neurotrauma and neuropathology, aging and neurodegeneration, and then neuroengineering. Uh, and uh, again, there's a fair amount of interest in translating that into therapeutics as well. And again, some faculty, not every faculty member has to go through this entire spectrum, but those who are interested, we have uh, great uh, resources to help them move along. Um, so here's just one example. Again, I'm not an expert at this, but uh, Terry Powley is a, is a very seen, uh, you know, prolific professor in our uh, psychology department and Pedro Irasoki is in uh, biomedical engineering. They've collaborated. I mean, they've, they've received, uh, you know, one $10 million grant after, grant after another to come up with sort of nanoscale wireless sensors to place um, to, uh, to treat different sort of neurological disorders, including depression. So uh, this has been a very successful uh, group and uh, GlaxoSmithKline, for instance, uh, supports this, including, and, and so does DARPA, et cetera. Uh, that's just one example. On the infectious disease, immunology, and inflammation side of things, we are all very proud of a recent uh, uh, discovery at Purdue. Our colleagues uh, Richard Kuhn and Michael Rossman, um, structural biologists. Uh, Purdue has, been, has long been known as a, uh, as a center for structural biology. Um, and so they came up with the, uh, 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 with the structure of Zika at a 3.8 angstrom uh, scale. It was unprecedented, it was a paper in science. Maybe those of you working in this area are aware of the, of the work. Um, this was one of the early gets out of the Institute for uh, Integrative Neuroscience. We're very pleased with this. And of course, as you all know, one of the pluses of having the structure in great detail is then the therapeutics and how to, how to solve it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it offers uh, pathways to, to treating it. And we actually have some uh, faculty in chemistry and, and other departments that are looking to, to, to match, essentially, uh, uh, cures to this thing. Um, and so uh, because the, 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 the uh, panel is primarily on startups and how to uh, affect these startups uh, uh, you know, without, uh, w with as few resistance uh, elements as possible, um, Purdue has probably one of the, this is one thing we're very proud of, is one of the most um, well-developed and uh, friendly entrepreneurship ecosystem in the U.S. We've received all kinds of awards uh, for being the number one incubator, et cetera, et cetera. I'll show you some numbers just to give you a sense for it, and then we'll move into the panel. So broadly, right, for the entrepreneurship ecosystem, of course, we start off with funding for the research. Okay, an invention comes out. You need to protect it, go through the actualization process, have some societal impact, and come back to reward. Each of these things is very well thought through. Dan Hassler, my colleague who runs our Purdue Research Foundation, is broadly in charge of the uh, of this space and uh, uh, was actually a marketing person at Eli Lilly before he came to us and is just an amazing uh, colleague. Um, a piece of the uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem is what we call the foundry. Uh, and the foundry is where is, you know, I, I would say it's a little bit like C-Camp, although we each do different things as well. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that Slim you said was, the most critical thing you found was this mentoring and networking and that kind of thing. That's where I think the foundry excels. Um, and uh, they've coached 67 startups. These numbers keep going up every time I look around. Um, and, and a good bunch of entrepreneurs. And uh, we've put a fair amount, of, we've, we've, we've gathered a fair amount of funding internally to, to seed efforts uh, to match VC funding as well. Sometimes we find that the first $50,000 to the first $100,000 is far more difficult to get at than bigger monies, and so we've, we've been doing a lot of that. Um, and so the foundry is where companies are, say, coached to incubate, but pre-incubation, uh, we have a large space um, called the anvil. I mean, you'll see we're boiler makers, and so there's the anvil, there's the foundry, but let's not get carried away with that. So it's a large space, it's very well used, it's, I think it's the largest in the country, uh, a space of its kind, and it has lots of um, uh, capabilities for students at all, our, it's open 24 hours a day and they can come in and machine their things, et cetera, et cetera. So for some of our Peru alums, this is new, you don't know about this and you should come visit. 
So um, just a couple of numbers. Uh, again, there's, there's several ways to slice this, but the number of licenses have been going up steadily. We've, we've brought a focus to this thing. President Daniels um, truly believes in this, and really, I would say, that's his regime at <laughs> while he's been president of Purdue. So um, 147 uh, licenses uh, have been executed for Purdue IP. Um, Purdue ranks third in the U.S. for IP-based patent startups. For, for starting up companies. But it's a little misleading because the first two are the University of California system and the University of Texas system. In some ways, that's obviously an unfair uh, comparison. And if you took out, you know, if you actually listed Berkeley and UCLA and all by themselves, we would, <laughs> we would be at the very left of this thing. But 24 startups uh, is, is not a bad number. And uh, another way to look at it, and, and someone asked us, uh, uh, I forget when, but you know whether I think maybe Taslim did or, or Bala did about the startups, whether they were uh, Purdue licensed startups or do we also host outside ones? Well, so what this shows you again is we were kind of going along at about you know six, seven, eight, uh, but then we've had a serious uptick uh, for the last over the last three years. There've been 76 startups out of Purdue licensed technology, and then that many more out of um, either non-licensed Purdue uh, efforts or outside efforts. So really quite a, uh, a nice thing to, to celebrate. I'll sort of quickly run through a few examples. Again, I had to pick amongst, uh, you know, I don't know, 500 or so, so I just picked some. But that's Mike Ladish. I don't know if Shailaja is here in the audience, um, uh, she, the C6 energy thing. I think, you know, she might be interested in talking to Mike Ladish, one of our National Academy members, but also very prolific with uh, companies. And so they won the FDA food safety challenge. They can detect salmonella in extremely small quantities by, uh, they've, they've got a way to uh, take large volumes of very dilute uh, suspensions and, and uh, pick them up. Um, another one is Sherry Wojtek Harbin that's come up with this founded genius. Each of these faculty members of companies, so I, I, I talk about those. And these are collagen networks that she's, uh, that she's created. Um, to, to replicate sort of body tissue things. Jessica Huber, she won our commercialization award two years ago, I think. She's come up with an interesting uh, hearing aid-like thing, um, which essentially the, a Parkins, person with Parkinson's disease will have, the, uh, will, will have this device in their uh, ears. And what it does is to listen to the ambient sound and create the right kind of noise in the person's ear. And that apparently has the effect of making the person speak more clearly. And it's, I mean, it's an FDA approved order. I don't know if FDA approval is needed, but um, so it's a, it's a commercial technology. It's very successful. Speech Vive is what it's called. And, uh, and Jessica is just a wonderful colleague. We've also had visiting scientists. So, you know, you seem to be, uh, thrive on these networks. So we have a deep relationship with the country of Colombia. Herman Schaffer um, found some sort of clever products in, in, in the biodiversity of the jungles of uh, Colombia, brought these products to Purdue with uh, Mike Ladish, actually, that I first showed, and has now created these lotions and perfumes and things out of it, and he's marketing it. He goes to all these top, uh, you know, business uh, uh, incubator, uh, you know, events in Milan, et cetera, et cetera. But Herman has done a fantastic job with this. Um, and, the, and the plus is that whenever he comes to visit me, he brings me one of his lotions. So. I pass it on to my wife and say, here, I was good to you. Um, so then uh, I think that's my final example. Madhya Abu Omar is, uh, is president of uh, Sparrow Energy, which is looking at non-food biomass uh, feedstock to, to convert them to sort of high-value chemicals. Uh, his, his expertise is in catalysis. So with that, basically, I, I, again, it's a very quick look at some of the successes at Purdue. Um, if you wanted to look at a longer list, of course, you have your equivalent list, which is great. But again, we also do a lot of licensing to large corporations and such. Um, and uh, I think that's my last slide. But, and with that, I have uh, the great honor of inviting our panelists to come up and join us. Uh, they're listed in alphabetical order, except, of course, we, uh, we messed up uh, a little bit. So Vijay Chandru is here. He's the uh, co-founder of Strand Life Sciences and Strand Genomics. He was uh, a professor at Purdue for, for quite a while. Uh, Mitch Daniels is uh, president of Purdue University. He was two-time governor of uh, the state of Indiana. Uh, and he was the former president of Eli Lilly North America. So he brings a lot of pharmaceutical experience. 
Of course, Satyajit Mayer, uh, Professor Mayer, is your own. Uh, I, I don't have to introduce him to you. And Professor Rao was to be here. Uh, he had uh, some, um, some um, deaths in the family, essentially, that, he, that keep him from coming. So we send him our um, thoughts and prayers. But um, we have uh, an even better speaker with us, and that's uh, Dr. Gayatri. And so we will have them all come up. If uh, you could please come and join us. And we'll start a little panel discussion here. Maybe we can get the lights back on up here if you like. So, oh, <laughs> guys, take a moment. Or who? Are, yeah, please. So, so I won't go through any deep bios and things like this, but I think we'll just. Uh, uh, so, can we get the lights uh, up here on the stage? Thank you very much. Um, so I guess maybe just to start off, so we'll, we'll do a few questions first, I will, and then um, hopefully you all have brimming with questions, mostly for them, and I'll come and watch. Um, so perhaps we'll start off by whoever would like to address uh, maybe a quick take on the, the state of the life sciences in India in particular, and especially as it, um, as it impacts Startups? Is it a healthy culture? Is it easy to get going on startups? Uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges. So. So, uh, Suresh, maybe I can, I can speak. Please. So, I, um, <coughs> so the, uh, you know, the life science startup ecosystem uh, depends a lot on, on the uh, broad basic uh, research ecosystem, which is in some sense, discovery, discovery based. And, and that's extremely small. Um, I mean, the, the, the whole, if, if you put the entire community of life science researchers in this, in this country together, uh, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be larger than the city of uh, Manhattan or, or the city of New York. Perhaps even uh, the number of life science researchers, researchers in Manhattan may be larger than those all, all of India. So, so I think that said, uh, the, the connection and the, and the uh, link up to startups is extremely vibrant. Mm. Um, so, so even though the base is small, there is a huge shift towards thinking about startups as, uh, or thinking about you know, just translation as a, uh, as a, as a way to you know, fuel this, this basic uh, research ecosystem. So I think the, you know, the question that many of us basic research scientists would ask is why don't we grow this basic research ecosystem even larger uh, for the, to the scale that this country would need? And, and I think that's a question that's open and uh, it's a question that you know, we've been asking the, uh, the government at large. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jitu, if I could just do a quick follow up on just that. Sure. Um, so I, I used to be in India a long time back, and my sense always was that India was all about basic science and didn't, you know, sort of frowned upon application and translation and so on. But this was, you know, quite a few years ago. Has that changed then? Is it, uh, is it fashionable? Is it, is it okay to, to think about translation? Well, I mean, I, I think we are, we are sitting with one of the pioneers. <laughs> so, so we should ask. Well, he came from Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> we should ask uh, Chandru that question. But, but, but I, I think that's changed uh, a lot. You know, it's changed because people have traveled the distance. Uh, you know, or as the president of the court of the Indian Institute of Science, and and he basically, uh, when he addressed the faculty for the first time, uh, he said, um, you know, the Indian Institute of Science has done tremendous work in translation which has impacted public sector research mm. in an extraordinary way. I mean, if you think of ISRO, NAL, you know, Bharat Electronics, uh, you know, CMTI, the machine tools, C dot, yeah. uh, C, yeah. and so on, right? There, there's been extraordinary. So that happened, I think, in the early stages of, the, of nation building, right? I would say till about the 80s that 
1980 or so was, uh, was that phase. Uh, and then what Mr. Tata said was, uh, but on the other hand, I haven't seen any research park or private sector uh, developing as spin-offs from, from the university. So that night, uh, four of us in computer science actually wrote to the, to the director, at that time Professor Govardhan Mehta, and we said, uh, well, you know, I think we have a couple of things in our lab that we'd like to, to commercialize, and what is the process? And he said, there isn't one, but I'll appoint <laughs> a committee. <laughs> right. So you appointed a committee, and uh, it took about a year and a half to get, you know, all the issues of conflict, of interest, and various things sorted out. And in 2000, we actually launched two companies, Strand and another company that made handheld computers. It was called Simputers. And uh, so I guess that's, that was the first time in India that you had a university uh, actually sanctioning faculty to go out and start a company. And the university has a stake. Uh, so, so you know, they they are. Uh, uh, so all of that had to be figured out, and of course, since then, that framework has been uh, refined and developed all over the country. I, it's still a small number of such startups. Uh, I think, uh, particularly startups where uh, the the primary investigators continue to be involved, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's uh, it's still a, a, a small number, but I think the the ecosystem is is now developing where hopefully there'll be more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of the ecosystem, Gayatri, you've certainly uh, done your share of this uh, the other part of town. So yeah. your take on so, this? So yeah, uh, as did you said, it's a recent phenomenon, and I think uh, when uh, Vijay Chandru and others started at that time, we we did I did an analysis, and it was clear that. All academics who had started companies had had to leave their academic job. Okay, none of them had continued. Today, that's no longer the case. And the second point is, I think if you look at some of the better biology departments in the country, the participation of faculty in companies would range from zero to maybe 50 percent. We're seeing the higher figures in a few departments, and generally those would be the younger departments and younger faculty. And I think still some of the older faculty are not very comfortable. Yeah. So, so Mitch, I mean, we've heard then about right, the growing uh, or somewhat nascent but, but growing uh, ecosystem here. So perhaps you could speak to the to Purdue's experience over quite a few years, but our recent uh, push in uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem and startups and so on. First, I'd really have to say thank you to our host. Uh, we've had a fascinating uh, morning and uh, uh, are taking home a lot of uh, of uh, ideas and ex great examples to follow. So I, I still want to omit to thank Professor Mayer and, and all his colleagues who uh, made this a very, very illuminating uh, few hours. It was very interesting to listen to that because uh, the U.S. as I see it, and, and certainly as I've seen it through the lens of, uh, of Purdue University the last uh, four years, uh, has followed a very similar tra trajectory. As I debriefed uh, Purdue faculty four years ago, uh, you can still find those who remember being told your career will be harmed if you dirty your hands with something that, that leads to a, a commercial product. That's not what we're here for. Then there apparently was a phase in which uh, rising faculty were told, well, you can do it, but it won't help. You know, what you really need is to be the first name on a, num on a number of papers. And you're wasting your time if you do these press, commercial <coughs> um, So uh, there were still vestiges of that when we got there. And we have done all we can think of, and we're always shopping for ideas, that's one reason we're here, for how we can make our ecosystem, is a good word for it, I think, as, fa as faculty friendly, inventor friendly, student friendly as it can be. Um, and uh, I won't take you through all the steps, but they do include changing faculty incentives. It's written into our promotion, tenure and promotion policy now, that, uh, <coughs> that entrepreneurial activity 
uh, is uh, to be recognized and rewarded. It can be documented just like basic research or great teaching is, is required to be documented. Um, uh, we have uh, tried to uh, eliminate this, this uh, incredibly defensive posture that most American universities have been in. I, I've, I've um, heard this sort of story many times, but one I, I'll recall uh, particularly was a, a professor told me I had to borrow money on my credit card, hire a lawyer, to negotiate with my own university. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, the patent clock was ticking away. Mm. So uh, I was pretty new to this, but I knew that wasn't the answer. I had been in the pharmaceutical industry, and we'd been out. In fact, part of my job for a few years was to search for new technologies, new platforms, uh, uh, new molecules, um, and, uh, and, and to partner with uh, whoever had found them. And it seemed to me that's the way the world ought to be working. And so we've, we've dismantled all that. A, a, a faculty member can sign uh, a, a standard contract that's very friendly, no front end money, very uh, minimal royalties and so forth, in five minutes now. Um, Suresh showed you we've tried to put in place structures, much like CCAMP, that, that uh, will help. It, it's a very rare inventor or scientist who also um, has the skills or even the interest to, to uh, successfully launch or grow a company. And so we've, uh, we've recruited people who've done that successfully to coach or even to come in as the, as the CEO. Uh, all these things and more. Um, and so uh, I'll just give you one last example. Uh, I was having dinner early on in my tenure there with, with a lot of students. Uh, afterward, I, we're just talking. I asked a, a group of, of, uh, of them what was new. They said, well, we just finished our senior engineering capstone project. How'd it go? Mm -hmm. Well, we think pretty well. The professor says it's uh, probably patentable. <laughs> I said, terrific. Are you going to patent it? And they said, well, it's not up to us. He says it's up to him and the university and so forth. So the next morning I changed the policy. <laughs> <laughs> and from that moment on, undergraduates, now the graduate students are a little different because we're paying you know, for them, but, uh, but undergraduate students on our campus own their own IP and we'll help them uh, protect it if, if it, that's uh, justified. And um, I have to tell you honestly, at the time, I thought this is just a symbolic step. It, it's, we're just trying to send a signal of the kind of place we're trying to be. But that was completely wrong. Seven of those startups that Suresh talked about were started by undergraduates mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with, with IP that, that we helped them secure. And so we're not where we want to be, or where I think we're going to. But we have, we have I, I hope, as a campus, at least that, I think in our campus, best I can estimate, about a third of our faculty, which is several hundred, seem to be interested in you know, this whole, and, and to do work that is amenable to what we're talking about. And uh, we just want to be on their side in every way possible. And uh, we've embraced this as uh, not just an acceptable part of our mission, but as a core part of our responsibility as a public university. Oh, thank you, Mitch. I'll, add, I'll just add one thing on, from the Purdue uh, perspective uh, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, appropriate here. So Purdue has more Indian students, undergraduate students, than any other university in, in the U.S. Um, and I think, I think President Daniels would agree that um, you know, they have a, a larger representation in the uh, IP development at Purdue and the startup development than their numbers at Purdue would indicate. So, so if Indians can come to the U.S. and create startups all over the place, and of course you've heard of the Silicon Valley being really overrun by Indians and so on, um, right? So why not in India? And, and so that's something to keep in mind, but certainly we're very proud of uh, the successes of the Indian students who come our way. Um, so. Uh, Professor Mayor, I think, you know, I was certainly very impressed and somewhat shocked at how many partnerships you have, uh, collaborations with, uh, uh, you know, faculty member at Cambridge spending time here, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in the IP space, in the startup space, 
that's again a, a very interesting thing. So both in terms of how um, folks wanting having an entrepreneurial bent here, connecting with labs overseas, but also with venture capital, with uh, with companies overseas. I guess you, it seems to me like you've been quite successful, but maybe speak to the challenges uh, or things you've been trying to do to make that happen better. Um, you know, I, I, I think one <coughs> big difference between the Purdue ecosystem and, and the one here, which makes uh, us have a lot more challenges, is, is the fact that we are a publicly funded uh, institution. Right? And, and our, um, you know, everything here is funded you know, mainly through core funding from the government and taxpayers' money. So, so you know, the, the policies that we have need to connect to those, uh, those uh, uh, um, uh, the strictures that come from using that, that kind of money. Um, but you know, that said, uh, many of our international collaborators see, th see putting, putting in uh, resources, mainly in, in the form of people, like uh, some of our activities at from uh, connections with Edinburgh and Cambridge, um, big largely because you know government, which is a stable partner, comes along and says we will fund the we will fund the discovery that's happening in this space and won't share the IP with uh, with anybody that's willing to put in things that will be useful to develop here. Uh, so the next steps will I think we we're in early days in terms of in terms of being able to realize some of the uh, discoveries that have come from these collaborative ventures that, have, that, that are with our partnerships overseas. Uh, but I think uh, in the days to come, we will, we will have to address some of the questions that, that connect to how this public funded money then contribute to building enterprises that, that are you know, maybe privately owned or, or somewhat public and private partnerships which can then benefit uh, you know, a larger ecosystem. So, so there, are, there are huge challenges, and I think we're going to see, see some of these challenges as, and deal with them as they come ahead. Uh, at the moment, things have been good because we've had a stable funding system from the government. Uh, I think and I wish that there would be more private funding that comes in uh, to support some of these you know, risk, risky ventures that can only be possible in a, in a discovery-based uh, environment. Savita has taken care of that. I think she, she's, <laughs> she's handled it. So. Um, by the way, Purdue, for those of you who may not be aware, is a state, a state university. university. Oh, it's a state so, university. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, uh, I thought you said <laughs> private. No. Uh, no. no public. Public, okay. It's a public. No, so, so then I think there's a lot that we can yeah. learn from yeah. how one engages with state-funded programs and state-funded activities as it connects to um, entrepreneurs. So a fair amount of the funding uh, in the life sciences comes from NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, and they have, you know, the government has margin rights and things like this, just like here. Of course, our private sector funded work is, you know, ha comes up with its own agreements. But, uh, but it seems like to me, like, from, from what I've heard, that the entrepreneurship, the startup community here, is quite worried about interfacing with maybe venture capital overseas and, 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 uh, and resources overseas. So perhaps we could hear some more thoughts on that, both the challenges and maybe what can be done to improve things. Uh, no, you start, um, so, you know, uh, I think it's well known that there isn't much VC money here for uh, this uh, sector, especially an area like drug discovery. You might have some phenomenal work actually happening in startups. Even the big companies which had started drug discovery, uh, some of them would sort of close down or really withdrew from that, but some have, uh, of course. But uh, startups are doing, and recently there was, uh, everyone may not know, there's a small company in Noida called Curadel, and they signed a deal with Roche for $500 million mm -hmm. uh, and received an upfront of $25 million. And this was drug discovery done in a startup. I thought that was remarkable. Yeah. But you know, when you, I've talked to startups and the kinds of struggles they've had are something unbelievable. I know some uh, people who mortgage their house to fund their company. Curative, right? Curative. But the other thing that they've had to do was pay a bank loan right at the end. So he had to do a little bit of work before which Roche couldn't take it. And he had to borrow money at 18% interest. 
more business. Okay, so I'm sure that 25 million some went to pay that uh, uh, sum. So there really, uh, there are struggles. Uh, mm. And one thing uh, I should remark since, you know, government policies play such an important role. Yeah. A few months ago, the Department of Pharmaceuticals had announced the intention of setting up a thousand crore VC fund, the government, for drug recovery. But I don't think it's really flourishing. So if the government were to start playing that kind of role, uh, then it would be much easier you know, even for yeah. public funded institutes to engage yeah. with this. You know, that said, I think uh, what I've at least seen of the, the ecosystem, and uh, just incidentally, I, I was also the president of the Indian biotech industry body for a few years. So during those years, I was particularly active at this. Uh, the, um, there is a fairly nice uh, funding structure now for seed funding, for small business initiation, and you know a lot of the startup and incubators uh, around the country are really benefiting from that. And it's uh, it's actually a program called BIRAC, which is uh, run through the Department of Biotechnology, which has enabled a lot of that. Um, furthermore, there's there's a lot more money going into this kind of thing because of the current uh, sort of focus on entrepreneurship, and uh, so there was. There's this thing called the Atal Innovation Mission uh, through the Niti Aayog, and that has now access to funds. And um, so, so you know, we we will continue to see a lot of funding at that level. Now, going to a Series A is where you know the challenge is. I think uh, you know, I think lots of uh, companies uh, just sort of get stunted because you know, the lack of risk capital at that level. And, uh, you know, so either they have to find a revenue model, right, and earn, you know, very early in their, um, in their lifespan, uh, or they just disappear. So, so I think that's where this challenge of venture funding is coming in. That, in life sciences, I think there's a lot of venture money in India. <coughs> Uh, which does pick up Series A, you know, Series B, and so on. Uh, but a lot of it was either designed for uh, tech, you know, mm -hmm. uh, IT, or services, and, and um, it's not IP-driven, so, so it doesn't help the cause that we are talking about. So, uh, and uh, and so you know, those those funds have a much shorter life. And they're all looking for exits, you know, in the three to five year. <laughs> and it's very difficult to do life science companies with that kind of uh, right. funding. So, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. Well, I'll just observe that it's the, 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 the contrast here with current state of play in the U.S., which I, I suspect can't run much longer. In fact, yeah. there, there's, there's been a, and biotech has had its, its uh, trough period, and it's in a surge period right now. Um, there was an astonishing to me amount of both of M and A activity, yeah. close to four hundred million dollars, I think it was, in the last twelve months. Mm -hmm. uh, one fourth of all the IPOs in the last year in the United right. States were we're over a hundred of them were in um, biotech. And uh, but I, my impression is, and I'm, I'm not living in the industry and haven't now for a long time, but my impression from the outside is this is driven by two forms of desperation. One is the general desperation of investors looking for yield anywhere mm -hmm. in a zero interest rate, uh, low growth environment. And the second is uh, the increasing desperation, particularly of uh, the big pharmaceutical companies who are not productive in their own research, um, the, uh, as measured by uh, you know, uh, new drug approvals for uh, dollar of research and so forth, productivity is at an all-time low. And so uh, I'm hearing and reading about uh, investments uh, and sometimes acquisitions of, of uh, molecules, for example, at stages so early that uh, it can only be a mark of desperation. They're, they're spending enormous amounts of money sometimes to buy molecules that have a 1 in 10, 20, 50 chance of progressing the market. So uh, um, that, that, that's why people are talking about a possible biotech bubble. 
and um, I, you know, I, I hope that they're wrong. I hope that the quality of this research is markedly higher than it has been historically, but we haven't seen evidence mm -hmm. of that yet. And um, uh, but uh, you know, more power to those to those uh, uh, scientists and inventors and young companies who are who are uh, scoring as they are. Thank you. I, you know, I've got a whole bunch more questions, but perhaps uh, are there folks in the audience who would like to ask a question or two or three? And if not, I'll go back to asking. Uh, there's a mic down here, please. Uh, the first row, and then there's a cluster of them. <laughs> so, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Suresh. And a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, my curiosity was aroused by one slide which you showed. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Ramesh Jairaman. I'm an entrepreneur of a contract research services organization for the life science industry. We're based out of Bengaluru, and I'm an alumni of the University of Agriculture Science right across. So coming back to the slide, which, you, which I was um, interested in, I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry in AstraZeneca, and I know how tough it is to get a drug in the market. You spend $1.2 billion, approximately. That's the figure they have pegged now. What I saw in the slide was that University of Purdue has moved compounds to the market. So how does that work in the university system? I'm really uh, curious about that. Who, do you have a discovery team which runs? Who manages the project? How do the faculty coordinate and run? How, how do you do that? Uh, go ahead. It's, well, it's a combination. Many of these uh, have, uh, are public companies who have successfully uh, earned, in fact, the, the most progressive and, and, the, and the only ones uh, that have got, gotten to market got there through the vehicle of a public company which attracted uh, ample uh, investment funding which uh, uh, carried out the successful clinical trials. Uh, in, we have a range, we have individual uh, funds around some of the molecules you saw there where someone uh, feels called to uh, try to help the world achieve a, a cure for a malaria, for example. Um, uh, but in, in many of the others, uh, it's the same struggle that, uh, that uh, small companies everywhere uh, face, uh, trying just to get enough money to make enough progress to get the next round of money. And, uh, uh, but uh, we have a, some of our people have a track record such that uh, Inspires investor confidence. So I might add just to your uh, question some a little more, and that is, like probably everywhere, there are a few stars that know this. They've done it. They're successful. They keep doing it, and we try to get them to mentor others. So, and, and then you know, there's there's a whole bunch of folks who've got these amazing compounds on their shelves who couldn't be bothered for one thing, or don't even know what they have on their shelves. And so there's, there's a big spectrum uh, at Purdue amongst, if I took 100 faculty members that broadly do drug discovery, you know, there's probably 30 or 40 that couldn't care less and maybe five or six or eight that are very good at the other end. Um, so I, I think we've been asking ourselves, you know, is it one or two stars or is it an engine at Purdue? Is there an engine that supports this? And I would like to think that we have both. And so recently, and I, you know, Taslim has all the answers, really, you should ask him. But um, we recently brought on a chief scientist from a, from a big pharma company to Purdue, primarily to act as a commercialization mentor for our faculty. And it was very important that this person have a PhD, have a you know, track record in science, understands the lab science, but has been in big pharma. Um, and He's tasked, essentially, uh, he, that's, this is all he does, he's a staff member, right, a president's fellow, that looks at this and is trying to connect and figure out that handoff, right? When is the technology interesting enough? You know, a faculty member may think, I came up with this compound, I wrote a paper, we're set, but industry probably has no interest in that, so where is, when is the uh, technology ready for the handoff, et cetera? So we've got some of those additional resources we're providing, but... Uh, I'd say it's, uh, you know, it is a crapshoot in some ways as well, and we happen to succeed more often than we fail. Just one last point. Uh, uh, another of the, um, of the uh, changes that we've made in the last few years is uh, we've, we've moved our own 
IP policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis external partners as far as we think it possibly can be moved. And that, that is to say that we, uh, in addition to being inventor friendly, uh, we want to be we, uh, partner friendly. And uh, some of these molecules we believe will be picked up by uh, large, large well-funded uh, firms. Um, uh, if we're going to have the engine he's talking about, that's got to be a part of the answer. And so we've, we've tried to make the modifications that we think will uh, make that more likely than it's been in the past. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, so thank you for organizing this discussion. Uh, my question is to uh, uh, G2 and uh, uh, Vijay. Uh, so uh, I mean, whatever span I've spent in field of science, I've been always hearing that uh, industry has to invest in research in India, especially talking about India. What efforts are taken from the scientists to attract these private sectors to invest in their labs or in their startup? I mean, what are the efforts? Have, they, have there been any effort or what kind of things has been done? I'm He's so asking w how industry, I mean, academia right. draws in industry, so. Well, I, I, I think that that's all, I mean, that's, well, on this campus, for sure, there's, a, there's been a lot of industry partnerships uh, in a number of different collaborations. So, so I think when industry sees that there, are, there, are, there is scope and possibility of, of partnering so that something can come out of the, the engagement, there is a, a clear, a clear um, path. And, and we haven't actually had to go out and, um, and proactively bring people on, but because we've had a full, a full you know, stream of people coming through. In, especially after we established CCAMP. Uh, so once CCAMP got established as a, as a conduit to bring industry onto the campus and ex expose what we do to, to uh, uh, you know, people who have some knowledge of, of, of what it takes to, to go the next step, industry has come uh, you know, much, much more uh, frequently than, uh, than before. Um, of course, that's perhaps not sufficient because there is a lot, as Suresh was also mentioning, there's a, there's a lot of things that, that are possible to commercialize, possible to, to uh, take to the next step. And I think here one needs to have active ways of, uh, of encouraging this kind of activity. So again, CCAMP's been very, very important in playing the role of you know, at least exposing the campus to uh, possibilities of entrepreneurship. So I mean, so I, I think we, we are going to see a lot more of, of these sorts of partnerships. Um, they ha I mean, maybe the, we haven't publicized them and advertised them as, as that's what we are doing because we the, also do advertise our research. Um, so maybe you're not fully aware of everything that goes on, although you're on the campus. So maybe I'll, I'll just uh, add a note from sort of the industry perspective. Is uh, for example, we do work in genomics, right? We do uh, sequencing of DNA for all kinds of disease. And, uh, uh, quite often now, because the Indian genome has not been well studied, uh, we are finding very novel markers. Um, it's a great opportunity to then partner with an academic lab, which can then validate, right? Uh, and actually go through that whole process of validating that marker. And then it becomes a target that, that goes into drug discovery, right? Uh, very difficult to, to find an academic partner willing to work on such a directed translational problem, right? They may have a, you know, a, a model system that they've developed, uh, but they have their own agenda. It's very difficult to actually get them to, to actually collaborate. So we have uh, hundreds of such novel markers now lying around. And if there's an academic partner that's willing to, to start working on it, there's, there's a very nice translational program that can be set up. Right? Maybe I'll so. just add a little bit. I think we shouldn't forget Jitu's earliest comment, which is that the number of academics in the country is really limited. 
So if you look at any area, microbiology, structural diet, you're going to have just a small number of people, okay? So the sum total is small, and then each one is even smaller. So th and then even, I would say, research in industry, it's all relatively recent, okay? So the areas where the two would overlap, you have to find that perfect match. Small plus small, you have to find that saliva where they really overlap, right? And the number of entrepreneurs is not enormous. They're growing, certainly, especially last few years. But again, you have to have that, maybe an entrepreneur also who coincides with that saliva. So that's, I think, part of the problem. Right. Yeah, so um, Chandru alluded to this, and I just wanted you to expand, and maybe everybody else. There's many kinds of startups, and people don't usually think of IP-based startups. What are the distinct challenges they face? And even among IP-based startups, I think many people think of drug discovery, but there's many others. What are the distinct challenges these, these heterogeneous types of startups will face? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are platform-based uh, startups, which um, you know essentially you've developed some technology platform on which you uh, which you can commercialize in some ways. Um, that is IP. Um, in fact, that's what we were. We were uh, we had uh, you know we came from a computer science department. Uh, coming into life sciences, we felt we had platforms for annotating the genomes, uh, you know, which was the, the big task in the early part of uh, the century. So, uh, so that's the, uh, for, for platform-based uh, startups, I think the, the challenge was uh, that, uh, you know, we had to uh, e essentially uh, raise uh, venture capital that uh, that believed that there was enough of a market for for the specific uh, technology that we were developing and that uh, that you know and therefore uh, you know we could go forward with it now the the good thing about uh, this uh, platform based uh, model was that uh, you know we we could uh, uh, you know, it was largely a technical task. So, so you know, and uh, you know, the sales and marketing and channel partner issues came up, came up a little bit later. And by that time, we we had the sophistication to go forward with that. Um, I think drug discovery target uh, drug, drug discovery companies. I think um, uh, I've I've watched uh, Connexius very closely, right? And Connexius. Uh, is, an, uh, is another company that spun out of uh, uh, Indian Institute of Science, and uh, and there, you know, the Nadatur group uh, funded that, and uh, and initially they did fairly um, science-based work to to actually arrive at their drug discovery problem. Right, uh, I think uh, Suri and others basically set up labs to study pathways, and and uh, and it was through through that they arrived at certain strategies. And then once they got to molecules that looked interesting and had a pipeline, they actually had to be somewhat um, merciless in the sense that they just, you know, got rid of the entire sort of research group in, in the company and sort of put all their resources into licensing what they had, right? Uh, so it's a very different kind of approach. Uh, Strand has just grown and grown and grown, you know, sort of uh, bloated in some ways. Whereas you know these guys were able to to actually focus on 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 the IP that that was valuable. That uh, and you know they they've also licensed to Boringer Ingelheim. So another success story for for sort of drug discovery. Uh, so yeah, I think the the narratives are generally of this kind, you know, they're, uh, 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 and uh, the challenge with platforms is that markets are global much more so than, than local, and, uh, and so, you know, will you set up a global sales force? That's a huge challenge, right? Uh, or do you find channel partners? In the case of Strand, we found Agilent as our channel partner, and, and we worked through them, but, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, uh, so again, strategy is really vary depending on, on the, the type of life science company. Yeah. Actually, IBAB, you have experience there in this. Uh, do you, would you like to address this? Or? No. Okay. The question back. Uh, yes. 
Okay. So sorry, it's sorry. slightly a follow-up to Mukun's question, but uh, most mostly concentrated towards uh, uh, let's say, let's say uh, a consumer tech in healthcare per se, which is not strictly an IP driven because there is quite trust in terms of IP driven both let's say CCAMP and IBAB and things like that. But at this stage of let's say a proof of idea. Uh, there, I don't. I do not see a big trust coming in terms of, uh, uh, for example, if you take a consumer tech, there is all these accelerators that help you sort of go towards, uh, let's say, a seed or or a Series A. But there is still a quite big market for consumer tech in health healthcare space, and uh, the question can be probably addressed: What are the things that are done in a U.S. ecosystem, and uh, where do you see this sort of an industry going in an Indian ecosystem? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I was just reading this morning about uh, the Theranos story. So, so I think you <laughs> sometimes you, you know uh, some of those models uh, don't quite apply, right? Uh, the, the, the consumer-driven models when you when you come into come into the healthcare and uh, uh, life science space. But uh, yeah, uh, you know that was just a little. Uh, I, I hope it's responsive. I, I think I caught the question, or at least uh, uh, the gist. Um, it's, it's only a question of when. People argue about the rate of this, but it's only a question of when, I, I think, at least in the U.S., and I don't know why it would be different elsewhere, um, uh, health care becomes much more consumer-driven and controlled than it's been now. Information, diagnostic information, uh, automated advice, um, people are already expert at searching their options uh, uh, for themselves, and um, uh, so uh, I see no reason to, for that to stop. I happen to be on the board of the largest healthcare IT company in the public company in the uh, states, and it built its business mainly on uh, electronic medical records and that, that generation of technology. But it's very clear to the folks there that if they want to continue growing, they're going to have to learn to mine the, the uh, uh, enormous amounts of data that they are already it's already passing through their system, and translate that into new uh, both techniques for better managing the uh, entire population and enabling individual consumers to uh, do more for themselves. And uh, I, I, Again, it's, it, it, it could get here much faster than we think. And right. We can all see examples of it already. There, there are sort of ethical and regulatory concerns that come in there. And, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, today they're advertising genomics, uh, uh, you know, uh, tests and liquid biopsy tests and all kinds of things in newspapers. And, uh, you know, and I think uh, that's a bit of a challenge. And I think. You talk to most physicians, and and they're really concerned about that because, you know, the the patients are coming in with all kinds of information which is half baked. Yeah, I had a question. Right. Uh, right. I thought let's let's go there. Um, for um, more time to you. I have a question because you said that the government needs to give a push. We have the Make in India. I mean, there's a ad in the Economist every week. We are on an academic campus. I have not seen any make in India trickle down for us. So I was wondering if you had any comments about that. Is that hype? Is that just a very slow thing and the exponential is going to happen only if the government isn't for another five years? This is clearly not for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think, okay. I, I, I think so, Sandhu is the... Uh, right, right. So, uh, so, you know, Dr. Right. Marshalkar you know, tells a very nice story about this make in India. And so. You know, he, he points to a smartphone, uh, the iPhone, and says, um, how much do you think you could make by manufacturing this phone, right? And that's what Foxconn makes, right? So it's $10 per phone, right? And it's, it's you know, by the sweat of your brow, right? You're, you're, you're making these. And it's great. It will give employment. It will manufacture. How much do you think Apple makes? <laughs> It's three hundred and fifty dollars of each phone, right? So he says that is dimaglagake, right? 
So, you know, that's using, using your brain, putting the IP, owning the IP as well as. So I think, it, it, you know, there's this, Make in India is going to, going to push a certain type of innovation and Invent in India is going to, you know, get, get, get that IP driven innovation. So, uh, but I, you know, I think the push to universities and university environments has to be invent. Right? Um, and, uh, but invent in a way that it's closer to translation, uh, get directed by, uh, by the market in some sense. The mark laga ke banane ga So, very insightful uh, discussion. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, Dr. Gayatri and Dr. Chandru alluded to this that VC money is really hard to come by for the life sciences uh, kind of uh, uh, innovations. So I was just uh, reminded of like uh, recently, uh, Anders Horowitz A16Z uh, launched a special bio fund uh, headed by uh, Vijay Pandey. So I'm just curious, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, tech, you know traditional VCs who uh, typically do tech uh, investments, having um, dedicated life science or healthcare kind of funds? And before we answer that, let me just say maybe we'll take one more question. I see a person that's uh, all right. Two more. And then we'll, we'll stop after that. Um, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, yeah, so, so you said tech people coming into into the life sciences and, and healthcare. Tech VCs, right? Yeah. So that's exactly what happened with Theranos. Right? There wasn't a single healthcare fund or a life science fund that actually backed Theranos. So nobody checked the validity of what they were claiming, and they were, yeah. Oh, th but Theranos is this famous, I'm sure most of people here have heard about it. It's the meltdown <laughs> company that was doing diagnostic tests. And, uh, you know, it was a classic confusion of tech uh, between a beta test and a product launch, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't get into healthcare and life sciences type of work without having the, the more detailed and none of the investors have actually gone in and audited and they put in money like 91 million dollars into Theranos. So, so I, I, I think there's a little cautionary note there and my, my guess is that uh, you know more tech investors can come in of course but they will look to see whether there is a professional life sciences investor now uh, or a healthcare fund that's coming in. Because they would have the right ways of evaluating, uh, you know, products and IP. Uh, you know, one of the amazing things that we see in, in the U.S., for example, is that you go into a life sciences fund, uh, a venture office, and I've done it maybe 60, 70 times <laughs> now, uh, and there's always a couple of MD, PhDs sitting there, right? who know exactly what you're talking about, who know, know more about your, your science than you do, right? And, uh, and you know, and I think, you know, there's, there's no pulling wool over their eyes, right? I mean, you have to, you have, to have, have what you say you have. And uh, so, so I think the domain is very important here. And I think, you know, it's going to take a while before, before people can, can cross over in this way. Right? You know, what we'll probably do is to take, the, uh, if the next two questions can go ahead and um, uh, give us the questions together, we'll try to, go ahead. You. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding, like, private funding. Um, does it shape the re kind of research you do at your university? Like, is it that if you get private funding, they sort of expect a certain kind of research to be done? Or is that... Um, people at your university are more likely to do research which is likely to get funded by a commercial thing and by that you sort of shape or shift the direction into a certain... Very good. I'll be happy to answer that. Let's take uh, that and since you've got the mic, we'll do that too. Let's yeah. quick... So my it. question is regarding the regulatory environment. Like I heard like in the sense how regulatory environment is different in the U.S. as compared to India. Like in India you require... like probably everybody knows and not actually known as a license right. You have to have so many permits to come into the market. And I don't know about the US. So since we have both the NLP, I can you can get a view about these things. Because I know like I have briefly associated with this very in initial 
phases of the pharmaceutical company, and I, I can say roughly 10 to 15 percent of the resources were went to get all this kind of regulatory approval. And for each initial part of that company, it's very big challenge because your significant amount of resources going to that part. Right. So okay. Very good. Um, let's hear that question. And could you pass your mic on to this person in front of you too as well? And that'll be the last two we'll hear. Go ahead. Yeah. So my question is going back to the Make in India uh, discussion. Uh, a lot of drug discovery companies had suddenly come up when, uh, because there was a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturing companies that in India, and our pharmaceutical companies in India were doing really good. So drug discoveries were getting funded. So do you think the same model kind of applies for biomedical engineering? And since we do not have enough sufficient manufacturing for biomed like companies like Relisys are not so many. So it's not really viable for biomed companies to grow really big. Okay. Thank you. And last question. So are we really sort of constraining ourselves in what sort of things we are thinking of as startups? Like that is healthcare, drug discovery, and sequencing and services? Or is there more to it than just just the healthcare and healthcare right. subsidiaries, because there could be multiple other things you could be thinking of. Sure. A quick example is some sort of a biomimetic approach where we learn something from life sciences which is done on pure research, but could have possible implications Thank you. and not just in medicine. Great. Okay. So we've got four questions. I'll actually take the first one if you don't mind. Um, I think the question is about, maybe this is what you're asking is, does private funding skew university research? Uh, or affect what we do, um, you know, so uh, my sense is that it's often, at least in the U.S., uh, and you hear about horror stories, right? Uh, I don't know, the sugar industry did this, and therefore fat got a lot of attention and not sugar, et cetera. But um, really, there are a lot of safeguards uh, around that. As you know, journals uh, say, you, you to say where your, uh, where your sources of funding are and so on. More often than not, my own experience, at least the Purdue experience and mine as a researcher, has been that you have some skills, you have some capabilities, and you, you know, you're well known or you publish in this area, so companies come to you or, or you go to companies that might be interested. So I really think it's more of a, a, a match between uh, skills and, and needs or, or so. Uh, I mean, I've not, I've done a lot of this, but never quite run into a place where a company has sort of influenced uh, the research, if you will, but... Suresh, I yes. thought the question was a little more benign than that. Okay. Uh, was it more? Okay, great. I, I agree with what you okay. said, sure. said, but I, I believe that... I would say it this way. Uh, certainly at this stage, uh, overwhelmingly, our, our, our scientists are, are studying things <coughs> that are deep interest to them. And, and uh, we, we did something at Purdue that... Uh, uh, I'm not sure why every university hasn't, but we only know maybe one that has that. His job is not only to support our researchers in their grant seeking and their compliance and the post grant activities, all of that, but he also has the Office of Partnerships. And this is, and, and so that's a two way street as we see it. Most of the traffic on that street right now is communicating to would be partners, companies, and others. Occasionally it's a foundation or a funder about interesting work that's going on on our campus. But increasingly, we are asking them, what are your problems? And his office just may know of someone on the, uh, somewhere on the campus who's working in the area. So um, I would say that our, our folks are generally determining their own areas of, of, of specific research. But increasingly, we are open to, the, to exploring um, areas that we have identified as, as uh, per perhaps responding to a market need. Thank you, Mitch. A much better take on the question. There was a question on the license, Raj, essentially regulatory hassles, perhaps, uh, hoops to run through. Maybe we'll let the uh, experts talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I've not been a practitioner, but yes, I've talked to a lot of startups, and what you say is correct. There are a lot of regulations, and I think the worst part is there's lack of clarity. The FDA, for instance, is much better at stating if you do this, we will approve your product. And in India, you never get that kind of clarity. And I mean, the kind of things people have done are incredible. I'll give you a very, I mean, there's no point telling a story. You probably already know. Um, and I think a lot of the startups have been arguing for this for many years, that we need clarity. Uh, and, you know, hopefully this ease of doing business score, which they're trying to improve, will include that part of it. Uh, 
you know, trying to sort out those things so that India's rank goes up on that ladder. And well, on the regulatory side, I, I don't think how we can escape it, right? Uh, there, there has to be regulation in this sector. There's, there's no way around it. Um, for example, in devices, you know, the FTA 510K is a much harder uh, accreditation to get. In India, you know, we get away with CE mark, as many other countries, as in many other countries. So, so you know, it's a little bit lower. But uh, uh, but then you don't get to play in the U.S. market if you are doing a device and only get the C mark. Uh, uh, and and I think uh, with uh, with drug discovery kind of work uh, and clinical trials and so on, the entire regulatory framework has been revamped and the new guidelines are out and and uh, much better rationalized than they were a few years ago when trials were pretty much shut down. And uh, so they've been, again, starting up now under the new regulation. So, uh, you know, I work in, in genomics again, and one of the, one of the uh, challenges there is, uh, is of course, uh, uh, the, what is certainly going to come soon is gene editing, gene, gene therapies, and so on. And, uh, and you know, there is a committee at ICMR that's actually looking at this and trying to... So I think the world is moving towards uniform guidelines, right, in, in one way or another. And, and I think, uh, you know, there are, there's, there's an aspect of ease of doing business and there's an aspect of regulation. And I think we shouldn't confuse those. I think ease of doing business should, should certainly yeah. be, be taken care of. Uh, but regulation, I think, has to be there. It just mm -hmm. has to be, you know, done than carefully and correctly and, you know, with alacrity if possible. But, uh, and the, the remaining questions, I guess, were about um, whether, like the big pharma-funded drug discovery, although I'm not entirely sure that's all that easy, um, will if the biomedical industry is young in India, I think is what you're saying, and as they grow, will, will they also support the biomedical end of things? I think the situation is slightly different in the U.S. I mean, uh, drug discovery funding is actually perhaps harder to get uh, than, than, say, medical devices. But, um, Jitu, you'd like to address that? Um, sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I think dr drug uh, manufacturing, what you mentioned ah. as, an, as a big industry, uh, was, a, was actually a lot of manufacturing of genetics, yeah. not necessarily uh, invention or discovery-driven manufacturing. So it was manufacturing things that, you know, I mean, and, and the industry is, uh, did very well, has, you know, has done a lot. I, I think they didn't put back enough, in my personal opinion, but put back enough into discovery. Uh, I mean, if we see the same thing in biomedical engineering and biomedical sort of sector, uh, it will be, be another repeat of that, of that uh, game. Uh, so I think unless one is prepared and the industry is prepared to put back money into discovery, um, it's, it's going to be, you know, more, more of the same thing. I mean, the pipeline for discovery um, in, the biomed in, the in the drug sector is certainly now coming from small startups and, and academia. Mm -hmm. But one needs to, you know, bring, bring uh, and, and it's not coming from the uh, generic pharma. They're looking at the space, but they're not picking it up. Uh, so. So I, I, you know, if you want to look at that as an analogy for, for biomedical engineering, um, uh, you know, one, one should be cautious. I, you know, uh, although I, I do think the, the pharmaceutical industry in India is something to be celebrated as well. I mean, it, it's, although it's, it's generic manufacturing and not uh, drug discovery oriented, uh, certainly has had academic connections with chemical engineering, right? Sure. And uh, whether it's UDCT in Mumbai or, you know, various chemical engineering departments around the country, you know, process chemistry uh, has, you know, there's been a lot of innovation and, and I think that's something to be celebrated. And we, we create medicines for the world, you know, yeah, in terms of uh, volume of, of production. Well, we uh, celebrate it particularly because Dr. Reddy's labs were established by Purdue grads as well as Lockhart Labs, uh, right. is also founded by a Purdue graduate. So. Right. Yeah. Um, I think there was one more question about, uh, you know, moving the applications. 
and that's really sort of a, a platform question, right? Once once you built a platform, you know, does it only have to apply to medtech, or or can it be in other areas as well? Can it have other impact? Just a small example: um, we built a, a, a platform technology for uh, predictive talks, right? uh, which we built. Uh, um, you know, we built a virtual liver. Uh, the, the systems biology model and then had an in vitro in silico <laughs> platform for, for being able to predict talks. And then our whole orientation moved more to genomics and you know, yeah. So when we started actually uh, selling, uh, you know, services around that platform, uh, we actually found the cosmetics industry was much more interesting, right? Uh, and uh, so, so you know, Unilevers and uh, you know various other cosmetic uh, companies came came to us, and uh, but but you know that that platform has now been moved to Sinjin, so it will be interesting to see what they do with it. But uh, uh, it, you know, once you build a platform, there are many many things that you can you can do with it. Right? So. Yeah, maybe I can add something. So I think what you were saying is not related to healthcare. Right? You were asking. Whether, whether one, you know, so the agri space, for example, is hugely un, untapped in terms of, you know, innovation and, um, and, and also, you know, uh, startups. Uh, in, on the campus, I think there's a big effort to try and build that up. Uh, uh, but the other, the other aspect is, you know, what does one lear learn from, the, from biological systems that can inform you know, chemical industry or inform uh, yes. inform, you know, many other aspects of, of, of our engineering, uh, uh, you know, activities. And there's a lot to learn, and I, I think that's a completely unexplored space. So, you know, uh, you should go ahead. Yeah. So, so, again, I well, have the pleasure of, uh, you know, in the interest of time, and you all have other things to do. Uh, so I'd just like to thank, certainly, the audience. I, let me call out, in particular, Aditya Kolkarni's help uh, in, in, in assisting with pulling this together while Jitu was in, I don't know, traveling somewhere and Vijay was somewhere and we were somewhere, et cetera. Um, so Aditya, who's a, uh, as a tenant at Seacamp, and uh, uh, we're, we're very proud that he's a, a graduate of Purdue, uh, Atten Porus Life Sciences. Uh, that not, name changes all the time. Anyway, an entrepreneur himself. <laughs> so, uh, so we thank Aditya for his help, but uh, thank you to the audience for your questions. I wish we could have gone on longer. Um, and certainly to Professor Mayer, Jeetu, thank you very much for, for hosting us here, Vijay, for coming out and... and From across the street. So well, that's great. <laughs> no, you guys, we, on, a sh on short notice, you were able thank to you. come in. Thank you very much. And great. Mitch, thanks for your remarks. So with that, I'd like to <laughs> draw this to a close. Thank you. And I, and I think just a moment. We, we have some things. Okay, well, I have some things, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. Uh, thank you. Sure, thank you. Easy to carry around. So you don't need a pen. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all.